So uh, the agenda for today is uh, what is DevOps, um, extending DevOps to databases, impact of database DevOps on data governance and compliance, um, and then I'm going to run a session um, around uh, DevOps and data compliance for you. The um, what is uh, DevOps? So um, a Microsoft uh, DevOps program manager has uh, been quoted saying DevOps is the union of people, process and products to enable continuous delivery of value to end, our end users. And what we're trying to do is uh, reduce the cycle time from um, idea through to fruition and uh, bringing together both um, the developers in the organization and the operational team which means that um, we can work um, in collaboration and ensure that our users are really seeing the value of the code that we're writing. Obviously, code only actually has value when the application is in the hands of the user. So um, the ambition with DevOps is to make sure that we get there as quickly as possible. That also means that we have a, a very quick feedback loop back into the development and operations team so that we can be enhancing the application very, very quickly and ensuring that the user is getting the best value of the code that we're writing. Um, DevOps has um, worked very successfully for many dev teams for quite some time now. Um, and um, the most valuable applications that enterprises can create um, have a, a data management system behind them. Um, but um, incorporating databases into the DevOps process um, is not um, as straightforward as a stateless um, piece of application code because we need to be very careful that we preserve the state that's stored in the database um, and we um, have the processes and procedures to support the upgrade of the database schema while still maintaining the state that we're um, storing. Um, while continually deploying that into a production environment. So it's important that um, as a team, you think of the um, process and procedure to support that um, database state, but also um, you put the correct tooling in place to um, support that process and make that as um, smooth and seamless as possible. But when we do include the um, database within our DevOps process, we get some um, great benefits um, towards it. Um, it means that our database is always in sync with our um, application development team. Um, previously, I worked as a developer, and uh, when before we included the uh, database into our process, it was always very difficult to uh, reproduce um, issues that users were seeing in production. Um, it also meant that the deployment of the database was always tricky as well, and keeping um, the application changes in sync with the database that was deployed into production was a really big challenge. By including the database as part of the DevOps process, it means that um, we're able to create some union there and um, ensure that the um, database development um, aligns with the um, actual databases that the users are using. Um, it means that we can have reliable traceability of these database changes because they're tracked within our source control process and um, for any auditing or compliance reasons we can explain why changes have been made and how they've been made into that production environment. Um, I've already mentioned the complexity of um, the development process around uh, database development um, and that was often perceived as a bottleneck during that process and by including the database as part of the overall DevOps process we're able to remove that bottleneck. Um, and I've been in teams where the DBAs have thrown the latest code at the last minute, and that could be months of um, development effort that they're expected to review from a quality assurance perspective before that goes into production. That's not a particularly um, valuable use of um, the DBA time, and it means that there's less rigor around um, the review that goes on because there's just too much to do in too short a time frame. By including the um, database as part of the DevOps process, it becomes a continual 
um, scenario where um, code is continually monitored by the DBA team and that's fed back into the dev team, means, meaning that there's a um, continual process for improvement around um, database code um, and the DBA's life is actually made um, more simple in that scenario. And also, by including the database in the overall DevOps process, we'll put some um, mature and rich auditing in place who, of who's accessed the data, when and where they've accessed it, um, and that can help us from a compliance perspective as well. Uh, the Red Gate team have recently uh, run a data uh, governance and implementation survey um, and they found that 64% of respondents said that DevOps had a positive impact on the data governance and compliance within their organization. Um, and this shows that organizations that have already um, started considering DevOps and started um, integrating it into their um, processes some procedures have been able to um, take advantage of it and it's actually helped them around the governance and compliance which is the um, subject of um, this conversation today so it's great to see that um, it's great to see that um, this is beginning to get adopted within the community and we can see that there's plenty more um, that we can be learning about it and and including A key um, part of uh, compliance is around uh, monitoring um, of both um, access and um, availability of the database environment and including DevOps in the process allows you um, to do that. Um, also um, change control and testing, uh, being able to create a reliable, repeatable and consistent process. Um, helps you um, from a compliance perspective because you've got a good audit trail of the lineage of code that's going from the developer's workstation all the way through to production. Um, in an ideal world, we won't be bringing data back into a UAT developer or test environment, um, but sometimes that is necessary. But then when we do do that, it's important that we um, have some robust controls and procedures in place to make sure only the right people have access to that data and that that data is only um, available to read for those that should be able to. Anyone that doesn't need that should um, have um, masking in place to uh, prevent unauthorized reading of that data. Um, and the automation um, means that we've got that repeatable and reliable process in place. Grant, have you joined us? I have. Hey, on? welcome. Hey, sorry <laughs> about that. No problems. I've explained that we've had a few technical glitches this morning or afternoon for us in the UK. Morning for you, Grant. Um, but uh, I've made a start and had a terrible attempt at uh, presenting some of your slides for you. Um, oh, just I doubt it was us, terrible. Get us going. <laughs> uh, I seriously doubt it was terrible. Um, feel free to keep going. I mean, I don't want to step Fantastic. in on it now. I mean, no problem at all. I'll uh, keep going until uh, the audience drop off. Um, so this is me. You were about to introduce me, weren't you, Grant? Um, my name is James Boother. <laughs> I'm the uh, Sales and Marketing Director at Curio. Um, formerly from a technical background, I started out as a software developer, then became a uh, data platform technical consultant at Curio before uh, joining the dark side for sales and marketing. Um, I still like to roll up my sleeves on a regular basis and uh, have a play um, to be dangerous in Visual Studio. So um, that's me, I'm um, on social um, and Coio have a uh, team blog, uh, which I occasionally partake in as well. So please do feel free um, to look me up after this, um, this event. So without any further ado, I'll go into uh, the agenda that I've got planned uh, for um, today. Um, I'm going to start out about um, what is GDPR um, because I know that um, there's um, a lot of unknowns about it out there and really want to try and set the record straight um, at the beginning of this session. Um, I'll then come on to some common myths. I've heard um, lots of myths and misconceptions 
around uh, GDPR um, and so I'd like to cover some of those off today um, and um, I'll also look at how we can um, map GDPR to um, the DevOps process which um, I've kind of introduced earlier on in this session. Um, and I'd like to leave you all with a few next steps, some actionable next steps that you can uh, work on um, and then we'll open up the floor for any uh, Q&A. Uh, Grant is going to be uh, monitoring the uh, questions as they come in. So if there's something urgent in Grant, then uh, don't hesitate to uh, jump in and um, stop me at that point. And I'm happy to pick up any questions. Okay. Uh, before absolutely. I do go on, do we have anything that we need to um, pick up there, Grant? No, nothing. Nothing's come up just yet. There were there were a few people. Um, we're asking if we're going to start, and, and we've started. Great. Um, but um, yeah, that's why you have an English accent. Yeah, and if, if you have any questions, anyone that there is a questions pane, uh, feel free to get in there and, and put it in. Um, and and please, the only only thing I'll say as introduction is please listen to what um, the definition of GDPR is, and and who it applies to, because um, I think this is going to be a revelation for a lot of people. It's very very important. And other than that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Keep going. Great. So um, just to confirm, you can see my slides okay, can you, Grant? Because oh, yeah, absolutely. Be a good indication fine. of everyone else being able to see them. Perfect. Good. Yeah, yeah it's all good. <laughs> That's brilliant. Excellent. I'll make a start then. So what is GDPR? So um, GDPR is a very thick and complex legal um, framework that was mutually agreed by the European General Data Protection Regulation um, in 2016. So um, all of the European states came together to discuss um, data protection and um, they built the regulation that spans the whole of the EU at that point. Fortunately for us, they gave us a couple of years grace. Um, the clock is now ticking because it will come into force in on the 25th of May 2018. Um, as a general rule, all of the EU members already had some data protection regulation in place and um, the EU Council came together in 1995 to form the previous version of this um, and that was implemented in the UK in the Data Protection Act in 1998. Um, as Grant mentioned, this may become a revelation to those outside of the European Union as well because uh, while this um, regulation was very much targeted at organisations that operate within the European Union, um, it, it includes all data for subjects that are within the European Union. So even if you're an organisation that don't operate within the EU, you may find that you come under the GDPR regulations because you hold data of individuals or subjects as they are known who live within the European Union and therefore these regulations will apply to you. So as I say any organization operating within Europe needs to adhere but also um, any organization that holds data for of EU subjects must also adhere to these regulations. The rights of the individuals have been further enhanced under these regulations. So as an individual uh, living in the European Union, as I do, I have the right to be informed by the organization holding data about me, about the data that you have on me. I also have a right to access that data. That means that um, if um, I find out that um, you hold information about me, I can make a request for access of that data and you have to serve that request in a reasonable period of time and uh, provide me with all the information that you hold on me and what you're using that information for. If I then find that some of that information that you hold about me isn't correct, I have the right for you to rectify the information you hold about me. I also have the right for you uh, that you should erase that data subject to me requesting that from you. And that can be throughout any system that you're running within your organization. I can also request that you restrict the processing of the data that you hold on me. 
So if you think about um, maybe you're running some marketing automation and you want to aggregate up as part of um, the analysis that you're doing, um, how I'm um, viewing parts of your website, the journey I'm going through and aggregating that up with other users' data, I can request that you don't do that processing about me. So these are fairly um, significant rights that I have as an EU uh, citizen about how you use the data that you store on me. Microsoft have um, recently released a white paper, uh, which is a guide to enhancing privacy and addressing GDPR requirements uh, with uh, the SQL Server platform. Um, and it's a, a very useful um, piece of information for you. Um, there's a link to the white paper down here. Um, one of the um, interesting uh, blocks that I've pulled out from this paper is um, the types of information that are covered by the GDPR. Please note that this is not an exclusive list, um, but this is some of the most pertinent data um, that you might already be holding about EU citizens that would be covered under the uh, General da uh, Data Protection uh, Regulation. Some things that um, we won't necessarily have considered but are covered under this in the past are things like IP addresses and cookies, for example. Um, obviously, all of the other information on here is sensitive data, but we need to make sure that we are treating it in the same way that the uh, regulation states that we should. So um, do um, start beginning to think about how you will assess the data that you store in any system that you're running today that's related to this personally identifiable information and how that may affect the way that you um, record, store, and process the individual's data within the systems that you operate. Um, and have a look at this paper because it's got some great insight for um, how you should go about doing this. Um, there is a very big stick that uh, the uh, regulation can hit everyone with. Um, currently within the UK, the um, ICO can fine an organization up to 500,000 pounds. Um, and we've seen a few high profile cases where organizations um, within the UK have been fined some big sums of money. Um, most recently, Talk Talk, um, an ISP in the UK, uh, was fined a significant sum of money for a data breach where um, a lot of their customer data was um, leaked um, out of their systems. However, those um, current fines pale into insignificance when looking at the penalties that the uh, local governing bodies can impose on organizations um, that commit a, an offense against the uh, GDPR. Um, they uh, categorize offenses into small offenses and, and offenses with serious consequences with fines of up to 10 million euros or 2% of the global turnover of an organization that commits a small breach and 20 million euros or 4% of the global turnover, whichever is greater for serious consequences or serious data breaches. Interestingly, there's um, little definition around this, so um, it's very much at the discretion of the uh, regulator in the um, region in which the um, regulation is applied within the European Union. However, I do want to share a few words from Elizabeth Denham, who's the UK's Information Commissioner. She's essentially responsible for implementing GDPR within the UK. And she's quoted as saying the GDPR is a step change for data protection and that it's an evolution and not a revolution. And the ICO are very much taking the stance that many organizations are already in part complying with the GDPR, and I'm sure there'll be work for many organizations to do to fully um, commit and um, complete all of the requirements for the GDPR. But she, she's very concerned that organizations are being, uh, are, there, there is some scaremongering going on within the community, and everyone needs to be aware of this, and everyone needs to be compliant with it. 
um, but we should be aware that this is an extension of um, the existing Data Protection Act um, and it's not a brand new set of regulations that no one has um, any uh, reference to or our current um, commitment to. So do bear that in mind uh, when you're going about this. Um, there are some severe penalties if you don't comply, um, but at the moment the ICO are very much looking at trying to um, support and guide organisations to compliance rather than um, looking immediately to fine people. As I said, the ICO are really trying to support organisations with compliance against the GDPR and they've started creating an awful lot of information around this. Um, their website is ico.org.uk and um, they've created a 12-step process uh, for which they go into a quite a significant amount of detail for each of these. Um, and it starts with um, awareness, so being aware of the data that you store and um, how you're storing and processing that data so that you can then start considering the information that you hold, um, how you're going to communicate this uh, privacy information to the users and uh, customers um, within your organization, uh, that use your organization, um, and how you're going to support individuals' rights. Um, when these subjects make these access requests, you need to consider how you're going to create a process around that. And again, they give you some guidance and support around that and making sure that the processing that you're doing on personal data is lawful and um, you're following the, following the GDPR guidelines. Some of that requires you making sure that you um, provide or that you get consent from the users that you're holding data on and the data that you're processing so it gives you some guidance around exactly how you should obtain consent to make sure that you're compliant and there's some very specific guidance around dealing with data of children um, this is particularly uh, relevant if you're working with social media and that kind of thing um, but for anywhere that you're holding um, or processing data about children, you need to follow some very specific guidelines around that. Obviously, we hope it doesn't happen, but it's very important that you have a process in place for um, when a data breach takes place. Under the data protection um, rules um, coming forward, you have 72 hours to report a breach um, to the local regulator within the um, EU uh, region that you're operating in. Um, so you need to make sure that ahead of time you are monitoring access to data so that you can actually identify a data breach and that when you do identify a data breach you've got a procedure in place for which you can actually inform the regulator about it because if you don't comply within that 72 hours, you're then caught, um, the, the punishments will be very severe. One of the um, clauses within the GDPR is that you design um, your, with uh, data protection um, impact awareness in mind from the start. Um, and this is really where DevOps can be of big um, assistance to you because you can actually document as you go through your process um, how you're um, improving the quality of um, your platform system and code base um, to adhere to the rules of the GDPR and then you can demonstrate um, that you are um, building to best practice and um, and to the regulation. Um, it's important um, that you have um, appointed a data protection officer under the um, GDPR. Um, there's um, some specific criteria around this. Um, you have to have a named data protection officer if you employ 250 or more people, um, and you need to have someone that's in that uh, associated to that role. Again, if there is a data breach and um, you haven't appointed that role, then um, the regulator will take a dim view of this because they won't um, feel that you're actually taking the uh, most appropriate steps to mitigate um, any data protection issues ahead of time. 
Um, the other reason that it's practical to appoint your data protection officer now is that um, you can make sure that um, as you start a process of um, becoming compliant against the GDPR, you've got someone whose role and responsibility it is to manage that process, document it, and provide evidence should you need to to the um, the, the regulator later on. I'm now going to move on to a few common myths that I've heard banded about as I've been discussing GDPR with um, customers and other fellow professionals in the industry. Um, and the first one that I've heard is that um, I can't comply with GDPR and use DevOps. Um, I um, blatantly borrowed um, this infographic from uh, the Redgate team, but um, I love the way that this um, packages up data, uh, data and DevOps all into one um, graphic. Um, and so what I've done is um, taken each of the steps that are pertinent to the GDPR and looked about how we can actually make use of the DevOps process to help support us. Um, in this. So if we look at uh, provisioning to start with, um, under the GDPR, we need to make sure that users have access to only the data that they need. So um, when we're setting up a um, good DevOps process where we're giving least privileged access to the different systems um, within um, the workflow that we go from um, dev to production, we can make sure that we've audited um, the users that we have um, provisioned access to, and we're only giving them access to the data that we need. So a feature developer, for example, doesn't need to be provided with uh, production access if we've got all of the right um, infrastructure in place to support them to um, do the role that they need. Um, and the um, GDPR requests that um, we implement Whoops, you just cut out. Are you still there, James? Access, and we're ensuring that all of our users are only gaining access to the data they need. Hey, James? Yes. Can you repeat that bit? Because you cut out for, for a couple, for about a minute and a half there. Ah, oh, sorry. sorry. So, um, from the beginning of this slide, Grant. Oh, no, not that far back. Just just the, like the last just the um, last Fine. three or four sentences, yeah. Yeah, sure. So when we're provisioning, we need to make sure that we um, give least access to the users based on their job role so that they can um, succeed in the role that they have, but they only have access uh, to the data that they... Um, users to um, the data that they need. So for example, if we've got a feature developer, we shouldn't be providing them with any production access at all. We should make sure that we've got um, dev and test environments that they can work on um, and they can successfully complete their role without giving them um, la uh, grander access to the environment. So we want to be able to provide a granular control and measures there. And this is uh, requested by the uh, GDPR because um, it's a, a part of the regulation requires that we implement data protection by design and by default. So we want to make sure that we're being um, security as a first class citizen in the whole process. Um, and by following a good DevOps process, we'll inherently be doing that. Then if, if we look at um, develop and build, um, by building um, unit tests into um, our code, we can make sure that we're um, testing uh, for security regressions. We can, if we then find that there is um, a uh, bug that's causing a security issue where, for example, unprotected, personally identifiable information is being um, shared uh, incorrectly, we can actually write a test case um, at, that will fail and then we can actually implement um, the fix of that and pass that unit test. Once we've got that built into a continual integration process, we can make sure we're continually testing for the compliance of that. And if there is ever a regression against that, we've got the automation in place to highlight that early on rather than a regression ending up in production and 
no one being aware of that. And again, this is um, proving that we're implementing um, good data protection um, policy by design um, and by default as we're going through our process. Um, we're also able to identify code level security regressions um, such as the code that returns uh, data to non-privileged users um, and then put our regression tests in place to make sure that we're um, then complying and remaining compliant against that. In an ideal world, we would never copy um, personally identifiable, in, identifiable information back from production uh, where we've got it very strongly controlled into a UAT or test environment. But occasionally it is a requirement that we do need to do that. Perhaps we've got a particularly difficult um, bug that we're finding hard to find the root cause for um, and we need to very carefully bring that data back into a UAT environment to demonstrate that we have resolved the issue before we release that code into production. Um, the Data Protection Act talks about unsanitized production data and that's basically where we've taken personally identifiable information and brought that back into um, a uh, pre-production environment and we haven't um, either pseudo anonymized that personally identifiable information or masked that information. So if we do need to um, do that, it's important that we um, then create a process to ensure that every time that we need to make that copy back of data, that we are either um, pseudo anonymizing that data, and that might be a process where we go through and um, run a script against the data as we copy it back into our UAT environment to um, scramble that data up so there's no personally identifiable information stored within that database or where we mask that data to prevent anyone from being able to read the unsanitized data um, in an un unauthorized manner. Um, and by following a DevOps process, we can make sure that if we do need to go through that process where we bring that data back into a UAT environment, we can um, automate the um, copy back of that data and the anonymization or masking of that data as a repeatable process. And then we can be um, sure that we're never providing unauthorized access to that personal identifiable in, uh, information early on. Or, or to um, unauthorized users. When we move around into release, we want to make sure that any personally identifiable data that we store is encrypted or pseudo anonymized. And again, if we've got a process and we've got some automation in place, uh, which the DevOps process um, would uh, support, then uh, we will be fulfilling our part of uh, the GDPR by um, ensuring that. We also need to make sure that any users that do have access to this production data have the right level of access to it. Um, and again, by scripting um, access rights and by uh, producing automation and by um, ensuring that we're monitoring the access to that environment, we can absolutely do that. And we should be using the tooling that we've got available to ourselves. I'll come on to this a little bit more when I look at the technologies that are available within the products. But we want to make sure that we're using um, encrypted connections, we're um, masking the uh, access to the data, and we're using row level security. Um, and we, we probably want to make sure that the um, transport that we're communicating over and the um, data is also encrypted at rest to ensure that we've got many layers of protection um, against unauthorized access to that data and that all access to that data is monitored and audited so that we've got a good audit trail um, should we require it and that we're um, actively reviewing that um, to ensure that we are complying at all times to the GDPR. Then when we look at monitor and optimize, uh, we need to look at um, the sysadmin access that we're providing the DBAs. Do they need 
uh, full level access to everything? Are they able to fulfill their job with some restricted access to the data? If they do have full access to the data, what checks and balances do we have in place to make sure that only authorised access is going on and the right operations are being performed against that data? And for everyone else, we should make sure that that access is restricted um, and audited. And then when we look at um, how we're backing up our databases, we need to ensure that we're um, encrypting our backups so that um, people can't um, easily gain access to the data that we're backing up. Um, and also, um, part of the GDPR requires that um, a individual or a subject can request that um, their data is um, erased from your systems. So we need to start thinking about um, what that means for our backups, because if um, we've got um, a very good uh, backup regime in place, like we should have, where uh, we've got a recovery time and a recovery point objective, if the um, user, or the subject, requests data to be deleted within the time window of us recovering a backup, how do we ensure that we've got the process in place to prevent that data from re-emerging back in our data set? These are big open questions that many users um, and uh, customers have got at the moment. Um, and these are things that you need to think about um, in your procedures and processes um, and um, having a, a strong, robust DevOps process in place means that you'll have time to consider the um, bigger um, questions that there are around GDPR uh, because all of the basics um, you'll have in place and you'll have the repeatable processes to support you and give you the breathing space to start thinking about um, these more complex scenarios and issues that you need to consider. The second myth that I've heard is that I only need to worry about production data. And um, it's interesting, I uh, referenced um, the um, Talk Talk data breach um, earlier. Um, it, it is believed that, and, and it's been published um, in the uh, trade press, that um, Talk Talk had a uh, marketing uh, platform that they, were, they had used and actually um, long uh, forgotten about um, that actually had a vulnerability within it um, and that was uh, where the attacker gained access to the environment to be able to um, take out the data um, from um, the corporate environment and um, obtain that and um, remove that from the safely guarded environment. Um, and so it really made me think that um, we need to be considering um, all um, areas of where we hold personal data, not just um, the typical um, OLTP environments that we would normally consider. We need to produce an audit across our whole estate um, for any data that we're storing and then consider whether any of those data stores and data, data processing environments are holding or processing any EU subject data. And Microsoft are um, stepping up and trying to support us with that. Um, and they are, um, they've produced a vulnerability assessment tool that you can currently um, point at any SQL DB databases that you're running today. And um, it will um, look at how you've configured the platform um, but then it will also go down into um, the schema of the data and um, start considering sensitive data columns that you've got within your schema. Um, and this is actually a fairly rudimentary test. It looks for um, typical column names that may well contain sensitive data. So it's not completely foolproof, but it will give you a good audit across your database schemas that you're storing in SQL DB um, to allow you to make an assessment of what you should be doing to work towards um, data compliance. At the moment, the vulnerability assessment tool is only available in um, SQL DB, in Azure, 
and so this is a great example where there's support for you in Azure that doesn't exist on-prem. However, Microsoft are working on making this tool available for all SQL Server environments on-premises and in Azure to give you the biggest helping hand possible to make sure that you've um, got complete compliance in your estates. Holding data in Azure prevents me from complying with GDPR is another common uh, uh, scenario that I've heard. And actually, we've already talked about the vulnerability assessment tool that was released in SQL DB first and is still not available for SQL Server, but it is, I believe, coming soon. Another example of where um, being in Azure actually provides you with advanced uh, protection that um, may be difficult to achieve on-prem is with TDE, transparent data encryption, where all data at rest is encrypted. Microsoft took the view that that's a very important feature, so with SQL DB, that is turned on by default. If you're using SQL Server Box product, um, this functionality is available within Enterprise Edition, but you do need to turn it on yourself. So if you're running um, SQL Server Box product, whether it's within a virtual machine, in the public cloud or a private cloud, or um, you're uh, running it um, on a physical hardware, look at um, implementing TDE, because there you, you can support your GDPR compliance by um, being secure by default um, uh, by implementing that. Microsoft have introduced advanced threat detection to SQL DB. This is where they're collecting holistic data and looking for patterns of unusual behavior and alerting you to um, this, um, this unusual behavior within your SQL DB environment. And this is a great way of helping you adhere to uh, the GDPR because um, this will give you early warning of unauthorized access to your data so that you can record it um, and mitigate against any risk or threat that this may pose. Again, this is a feature that's only available in Azure and not available um, with SQL Server Box products. Hey, James. Hey, Grant. Just a one note, um, I didn't know about this, so as soon as you said it, I looked it up. Um, Microsoft says that it works for the box product now. Oh, great. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. I knew as it was a, coming uh, soon. Yeah. As, uh, as it's come sooner than I realized. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Just, just thought I'd share that because, I mean, it, it should be, you know. Yeah, this is a really important feature. And, and um, you'll when, when you get hold of this, um, you'll be able to use it within SQL Server Management Studio and then start analyzing uh, the databases and database servers that you've got running um, against uh, any vulnerability risk that you've got in your estate. So um, that's a great shout. Thanks for that, Grant. So I encourage you to uh, go and look at this tool and start um, uh, making an uh, assessment against both your SQL DB and your SQL Server um, environments. Um, part of the GDPR is that you um, are able to audit access to your data. So um, this is a great feature that's available both within SQL Server Box product and SQL DB. So I'd encourage you to configure that and start um, actually assessing the auditing. Some of our customers have um, PCI compliance and um, ISO 27001 compliance. Um, and so they're already actually uh, following best practice around this and writing um, this audit um, maybe into the system log so that no one can actually delete that audit entry after it's been written and making um, a regular process around review viewing the um, access that is requested of that data to make sure that there is no unusual activity going on and they understand all of the access um, that's going on to that data. Dynamic data masking means that you can um, prevent um, users from actually seeing the content of um, some of the data that comes back in the columns that you're protecting with uh, dynamic data masking. Uh, one of the reasons I like this feature is if you're using it in a UAT environment, um, the data masking is actually applied after the query is executed. 
So the um, query processor will go through exactly the same optimization as it would do with the uh, production data, but you're not providing that personally identifiable information back to the developer or tester that's actually um, testing that environment. So it allows you to um, do some testing in a production-like manner without actually giving access uh, to those users that don't need to be able to view that uh, production personally identifiable data. Um, adding in as uh, many layers of encryption um, helps you um, protect your environment. So um, consider always encrypted, uh, which is available in SQL DB and SQL Server, and encrypting the connections between the application and uh, the database engine itself using encrypted connections. A feature that was recently added to SQL Server Management Studio um, which you can now download as a separate download from the Microsoft site. Um, from 17 onwards, um, you can use multi-form factor authentication with Azure Active Directory when you're logging in to SQL DB. So this means that um, not only do you need to know uh, the username and password in order to gain access to the database, you also have to have a device to authorize that connection. So again, this helps prevent unauthorized access where an unauthorized user obtains the username and password um, and prevents them from accessing the database themselves. So again, what we're looking at doing is creating um, protection by default and building lots of layers of protection into our environment to help us with both GDPR and our DevOps process. So I'd just like to um, wrap up with a, new a few next steps for you because I'm keen that you have some actionable items that you can go ahead and work on. And I like to consider this as two separate work streams um, and you've got a compliance readiness which your compliance team need to work on and a technical readiness where your um, technical staff need to work. So if we start with our compliance readiness, I would recommend that the first thing that you consider doing is nominating a data protection officer because then you've got someone in that role early on that takes um, the governance requirements of this as part of their role and then can support the organization through the rest of the steps here and also support the technical team with technical readiness as well. So the first thing that you really need to start doing is assessing your environment for where you are um, storing and processing personally identifiable information. You also need to consider um, where you may or may not be um, currently um, in breach of the data protection regulation. So again, if you've named, nominated your data protection officer, this is a great uh, first step in that role to uh, make that baseline assessment. You then need to look across all your environments and consider using the vulnerability assessment tool from Microsoft to do this as a first um, sweep through your environment and then start identifying exactly what you need to start doing in terms of technical readiness as a result of doing that um, compliance uh, baseline check. It's a great idea also to prepare yourself for a breach response because um, under the GDPR, you've got 72 hours to uh, report that to the regulator. And that's not a long time when you're in um, that scenario. You also need to consider how you're going to be monitoring for that because if you're not monitoring um, effectively for unauthorized access to the data environment, then you're not going to be able to report it within the time frame that's required. So consider how you're monitoring and how you're responding to a breach up front so that you're fully prepared for it in that um, eventuality. Hopefully it won't happen, but at least you're ready if it does. Then moving over to the technical readiness. Um, Creating a repeatable deployment process and a full DevOps process now means that your 
um, you're able to then start implementing the recommendations you get from the vulnerability assessment tool because you'll be able to iterate quickly and start adding incremental improvement to your data processing platform from the outset and also set up your monitoring now because you need to be ready for um, the implementation of GDPR. If you get that all in place as part of your DevOps process now, you'll be comfortable in operating that uh, when the regulation comes into force in May next year. And then once you've um, run the vulnerability assessment, you're going to want to work with your compliance team to prioritize the uh, remediation activities and then as a technical team you need to start remediating against that and get your compliance team actually recording the work that you're doing so that you've got your evidence to support you um, that you are um, designing for protection by default. So there's just seven steps there for you to work on rather than um, thinking that it's a massive um, chunk of work that's difficult to break off. I wanted to try and break that down for you so you've got something actionable to work against. Um, I also wanted to share um, some further reading with you. Um, the top three blog posts here are written by um, some of our team here at Coeo um, and uh, they've written some um, nice blog posts around um, the actual technical um, scenarios that are considered uh, during this presentation and uh, Grant uh, you've written a fantastic introduction to GDPR um, to really get everyone prepared and start thinking about how it really affects them so uh, I just wanted to point out that blog post as well. Oh, Thanks. Great, so that concludes um, everything that I wanted to share with you today. Hopefully you found that informative. Um, it hasn't um, scared you too much, um, but it's given you some ideas about where you need to start working in order to, um, to meet the regulation that's coming in May. I do have a couple of questions for you, if you've, if you've still got a minute. Fantastic, yes, please go ahead. Cool. Uh, first one's the easy one. Um, someone asks, us that, are we going to be sending the slides out to people? Yes, absolutely. I believe that Mary, um, who organized the event today, is going to be sending a mail out after this uh, with all of the follow-up information. So um, everyone that registered will get information about today, um, including the slides. Right. Okay. And then the other one, um, I really don't know the answer to this. How does um, data breach reporting happen for EU individuals if they're living in US and Canada, uh, i.e. where would that report go? So um, the, the data breach reports. So um, the data processor needs to make the data breach report to the regulator for the um, region of the EU that they're operating within. So, um, and then the regulator will work with the organization to inform the individual and that will be based on uh, the records that the uh, organization holds about the individuals for the data that they they hold so if for example you're an EU citizen living in the US then the re regulator will work with the organization to inform you via email or your postal address in the US right and then the next question um, we have another one that came in what is the actual definition of a breach is it is there a limit in size or who gets exposed so um, I'll need to look up the exact definition of that grant because it, it's quite complex legalese that's involved around that. But essentially, no doubt. I've read the documents. Yeah, <laughs> essentially what the um, regulator is looking at is any unauthorized access to personally identifiable data that comes under the governance of the regulation. So in the event that unauthorized activity takes place, the organization is obliged to inform the regulator of that incident, um, and then they will take the uh, appropriate acts following that. So we're okay. essentially looking at unauthorized access. Right. 
Um, well, that's all the questions that we have. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me today, Grant. It was a pleasure sharing this information. I hope that it um, helps our audience uh, get a bit more acquainted with what's going on around GDPR. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm sorry for the late start. Um, I apologize for not getting on here. Um, stuff happens sometimes. <laughs> uh, no, but, um, but I do appreciate all your guys' time uh, very much. And, and I learned a lot from this presentation, so it's very useful. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.